Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law. By request from someone on the channel, we are covering today the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals decision in the case of Keefe versus Adams. This case deals with a student who was disciplined and removed from a nursing school program because of Facebook posts this person made, not in school, but outside the school environment. And so the requisite question here is whether or not the student can be dismissed from the nursing school program because of these posts. So the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals is going to get into the relevant analysis. So we're going to read this and discuss along the way. Let's get started with this. Keith completed the practical nursing program at the college and became a licensed practical nurse in June 2011. He enrolled in an associate degree nursing program in the fall of 2011, seeking to become a registered nurse. He was dismissed at the end of that semester for failing to maintain the required grade level in all nursing courses. He reapplied, was admitted to the program, and again began classes in fall 2012. In late, no wow. in late November, a student complained to Keefe's instructor, Kim Scott, about several posts Keefe had made on a public Facebook page. She provided Scott printouts of five posts she said were threatening and related to the classroom. A few days later, a second student approached Scott at the start of a clinical class in which she was enrolled with Keefe. She told Scott that Keefe made statements on Facebook that made her feel extremely uncomfortable and nervous, and she didn't feel she could function in the same physical space with Craig at the clinical site. Concerned about patient care and safety in the clinic, Scott separated Keefe and the student during that particular shift. The student forwarded the post to Scott later that day. After receiving these two complaints, Scott forwarded the post to her supervisor, the director of the nursing program. This director contacted the vice president of academic affairs. This then contacted Keith and set up a meeting without explaining the purpose. So we got students reporting to instructors, instructors reporting to director of nursing, nursing reporting to the administration. So we got a bunch of people reporting this, and now we're going to set up a meeting with this student, but not explain why we're doing the meeting. All right. One of the instructors then received an email from Kim Scott relaying a student's concern that Keith had told someone there'd be hell to pay for whoever complained about me. On the agreed date for the meeting, Keith met with Fish and B Beth Adams, the dean of students. So now we're going even further up. So we've gone from student to faculty member, faculty member to director of nursing, director of nursing to someone else in administration, and now we're going all the way to the dean. So now we, we've gone all the way to the top of this, this hierarchy, and we're having a meeting with the dean. Incidentally, if you're called into a meeting with a dean, you know, you probably want to bring someone with you or something like that because something's probably not going to go well. I, I was never called into my life into a meeting with the dean or president of the university of my college. That would be something that would concern me. <laughs> you know, if that if I was called into meet with the dean, I'd be like, ah, uh, something's going wrong here, right? Okay, actually, I have to revise that. That isn't actually 100% true now that I think about it. I, when I was in law school, I did have a meeting with a dean, but it was totally a different issue. It was actually a really good story. It, it relates to me starting a law review at my university or my law school. And this will not mean much to people who are not law students because you wouldn't really understand this. But law review is considered a pretty big deal at most law schools. It's a professional academic journal. And perhaps unlike many professional academic journals, most law reviews, well, I think that's fair to say, most law reviews are edited and compiled by students in law school. So unlike many professional publications that are written otherwise, the, the law reviews are, are edited and compiled by law students. So the, the peers that are reviewing them are students rather than professionals in the field. So a little bit different in the, that sense, but these, this is what we do in the professional world of law. So anyways, I was trying to start a law review at my school and the editor of the main law review was creating all kinds of problems. So I did actually get a meeting where she was being called into the meeting with the dean because I was the one who was instigating it. So she should know that she was in trouble. Uh, and basically the dean asked what was going on. And the, 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 the head of the law review was like just giving her slack. And the dean's like, yeah, no, um, Kurt can run a law review and you can't stop him. 
So that was pretty much the end of that discussion. And then actually putting it together was a was a total pain in the ass. It was a a major problem because I was trying to start this thing effectively because they had they had fought me. The the main law review had fought me throughout the entire summer, and now I was starting my third year of law school. And we were already about a month into classes by the time I had this meeting with the dean and said, yeah, now you can start a law review. But I'm in a very bad position now because people have already made all the commitments that they're going to make in terms of time and things like that. So actually putting it together was a major trouble, but I got it done. I managed to get it done. I managed to get six other students to join my crusade and join my law review. And I managed to get the articles and I managed to put out two volumes of the law review that year. So it was a major deal, at least for me, and a major accomplishment for me. So I did have one meeting with a dean, but it was because I was wanting it, and I put it, I put in the request because another student was making my life difficult by not allowing me to run the law review because they wanted to run the law review. They didn't want me to do it. And so the dean's like, no. And yeah, that was a, that was a good story, good memory. On the agreed date for the meeting, Keith met with Fritch and Beth Adams, the Dean of Students. McCall did not attend because he wouldn't be responsible for review, reviewing any academic appeal. Okay. So someone, yeah, the McCall is going to be responsible for reviewing an academic appeal. I'm not sure how that's going to work because one of the people at the meeting is the Dean of Students. But someone else who's not the Dean of Students is going to review the appeal from the Dean. Sure, I'm sure they're going to contradict the dean. That seems like a thing that's going to happen. Fritch, Fritch began the meeting by reviewing the steps of due process policy from the student handbook. She told Keith that his Facebook post raised concerns about professionalism and boundary issues. She did not give him a copy of the posts, but she read aloud portions of the posts that she considered to be the most significant. We will produce only the posts that Fritch and Adams testify they gave particular concern. So here are the footnotes. Here are the, the articles in question from this thing that led this particular student into trouble. Okay, regarding glad group projects are group projects. I give her a big fat F for changing the group PowerPoint at the 11th, 11th hour, presumably, last night and resubmitting. Not enough whiskey to control the anger, which seems, you know, pretty banal, but okay. Doesn't anyone know or have heard of mechanical pencils? I'm going to take this electric pencil sharpener into class and give someone a, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that with it before long. I might need a anger management. And incidentally, I did look up that term before the train, the stream starts. And it's something about air appearing in the chest cavity and blood appearing in the lung cavity. And I'm assuming that this is bad, but I didn't fully understand it. So I will provide no further explanation, but apparently it's a fairly serious mental condition. I would imagine if blood is in your lungs, yes, this is a problem. But yes, I don't understand it, but yeah. LAMFO to a classmate. You keep reporting my posts and keep getting me banned. Banded. Okay. I don't really care. If that's the smartest thing you can come up with, then I completely understand why you're going to fail out of the registered nursing program. You, person. And quite, quite, presumably quits, but that's not what it says. And quite creeping on my page. You're not a friend. That's the wrong you're, by the way. That's... You are. So apostrophe. Okay. You're not a friend for a, of mine for a reason. If you don't like what I have to say, then don't come and ask me. That's basically, again, apostrophe. That's basically what's creeping is, isn't it? Uh, there probably should be a comma there. Stay off my page. So these, these comments seem fairly banal to me, all things considered. I, I mean, these, these comments are a little aggressive, but it's not completely beyond the pale or striking to me. It seems this person is just kind of upset with his fellow students and expressing it. It doesn't seem threatening or uh, problematic, but apparently it was to these people who read it, so. Okay. Fritch testified that Keefe was not receptive to the concerns about the post being unprofessional. Based on Keefe's lack of remorse, lack of concern, not recognizing, not saying he wanted to change, he decided to remove him from the associate degree program, which again seems a little bit exceedingly to me. Exceeded to me. Clearly, there was a lot of confusion about the professionalism. I did not. I didn't believe I could teach him. He's not responsive to what I said. You know, nursing programs have an obligation to graduate students who are not just able to pass classes, but to be safe and have all the soft skills, including professionalism. I could not see that he had it. In fact, he convinced me I wasn't going to be able to teach him. 
Not quite sure what about the post convinced you of that, but okay. At the end of the meeting, Frisch told Keith he could finish his semester and his credits would transfer as electives to a different course of study within the university. So you say, yeah, you can finish your classes, but you can't get a nursing degree, but you can use those as elective credits to some other program. So you can't become a nurse, but if you want to do something else, then fine. Okay, great. She also advised Keith he could appeal his decision to the vice president, McCalla. Beth McAv testified Keith appeared not to understand the seriousness of the problem. He was defensive and not seem remorseful or responsible. As part of enrolling in the associate degree program, Keith acknowledged receipt, review, and understanding of the nursing program student handbook. The handbook states that all current and future students are expected to adhere to policies and procedures of the handbook. Following the meeting, Fitch wrote a letter to Keith stating that, as we discussed, the decision has been made to remove you from the associate degree nursing program at the college as a consequence of behavior unbecoming of the profession. I'm not sure why it's unbecoming of the profession. I, I, I mean, nurses are allowed to have feelings and express those feelings. If it's not being done in the context of administering the nursing care, right? If these were, if these statements were being done even in class or being done as part of a practical or they're being done just to patients, then I could understand. But nurses aren't allowed to have a, an opinion that they are frustrated and express that opinion. It seems, it seems very odd. It seems very odd to me indeed. Following the meeting, Fitch wrote a letter to Keith Sting, as you discussed, we've been removed you based on this Facebook page, which doesn't seem sufficient to my mind. Keith spoke with Vice President McCall the next day to discuss the appeal process. McCall reviewed the substance of the post with Keith and referred him to a student advocate who helped him write an appeal. Before following the appeal, Keith sent Fitch a lengthy email describing the procedures in the due process policy that he had not been provided. So he said, I didn't get the due process, I was guaranteed. Keith submitted a lengthy due process appeal letter stating he had removed offensive comments from the Facebook page and removed myself from a social media network. Keith petitioned that he be allowed to finish an associate nursing degree program because I don't believe the punishment fits the crime. Keith argues the defendant violated his First Amendment rights to be free from to, to free speech by removing him from the nursing program at a public college for comments on the internet which were done outside class and unrelated to any course assignments or requirements and did not violate any specific rules. The brief frames this as a ca contention categorically. A college student may not be punished for off-campus speech, he contends, unless that speech is unprotected by the First Amendment, such as obscenity. To our knowledge, no court has adopted this extreme position, and we decline to do so. The First Amendment raised by the claim is significant. Where the First Amendment precludes a public university from adopting, as part of its curriculum for obtaining graduate degree in healthcare profession, a code of ethics adopted by a nationally recognized association of practicing professionals. Without question, the Supreme Court does not favor creating new First Amendment exceptions that could be used to restrict speech. But these decisions involve a question not at issue here, whether to recognize new categories of unprotected speech, which, you know, at least for me, are not different questions. You know, it's, it's, it's different questions. Yeah. The, the, so, I, I, yeah, I don't, I, think, I don't think there's a separate as the Court of Appeals does. Many courts have upheld enforcement of academic requirements on professionalism and fitness, particularly for a program for licensed medical professionals. Given the strong state interest in regulating health professions, teaching and enforcing viewpoint-neutral professional codes of ethics are a legitimate part of a professional school's curriculum that do not, at least on their face, run afoul of the First Amendment. I think in general that's true. I just don't see quite how it's applicable here. Because the statements seem pretty banal. They seem pretty just expressing negative opinions. They aren't being done in a practicum. They aren't being done in class. They're just posts on a Facebook page and expressing concerns. So I don't quite see how they don't have a, you know, don't meet the professionalism component. So it, it seems a little bit odd to me. Because professionalism codes of ethics are broadly worded, they can be used to restrict protected speech which I argue was probably done here. For example, a university may violate the First Amendment if it invokes a curriculum-based code of ethics as a pretext to punish a student's religious views and speech, but that is an as-applied inquiry. Here, Keith made no allegations and presented no evidence. The defendant's reliance on nursing association codes was a pretext for viewpoint or any other kind of discrimination. It does, it does seem like it is a pretext for viewpoint, in my view, because they're only censoring the speech because of the views expressed. So this isn't content-based. It isn't 
saying you can't express views of a particular kind. It's specifically restricting the particular kind of views. So maybe Keith done an oops here by not arguing viewpoint-based discrimination. So maybe this is on the pleadings more than on the, the analysis of the law. So maybe he did an oops in his pleading because it does seem viewpoint-based. We're only punishing him because of the specific things he's saying as part of his views. We don't like his views. We wish they were positive views. And so that seems like viewpoint-based discrimination. So I'm not sure I agree as a matter of law, although it might be more on Keefe on how he pleaded it. If compliance with professional ethics standards is a permissible academic requirement, then determinations of non-compliance will almost always be based, at least in part, on student speech. That a graduate student's unprofessional speech leads to academic disadvantage does not prohibit that speech or render it unprotected. The university simply imposes an adverse consequence on the student for exercising his right of speech at the wrong place and time, like a student who received a failing grade for submitting a paper on a wrong subject. A serious question... A serious question raised by Keefe in this case is whether a First Amendment protected his unprotected speech from academic disadvantage because it was made offline on Facebook campus postings. On appeal, Keefe framed this constitutional issue categorically, arguing that a college student may not be punished for off-campus speech unless his speech is unprotected by the First Amendment, such as obscenity. We reject the categorical contention. A student may demonstrate an unacceptable lack of professionalism off-campus, as well as a classroom, and by speech, as well as conduct. Therefore, college administrators and educators in professional school have discretion to require compliance with recognized standards of the profession, both off and on campus, so long as their actions are reasonably related to pedagogical, that is, teaching concerns. As the issue in the prior case that we're looking for authority was censorship of a school-sponsored campus newspaper, the course reference to legitimate pedagogical concerns was made in the context of school-sponsored speech. But the concept has broader relevance to student speech. The Hazelwood dissenters noted that an educator may, unlike Tinker, Tinker would be one of the major cases for free speech on, on campus, although it relates mostly to pre-college education levels, constitutionally censor poor grammar, writing, or research because to reward such expression would materially disrupt the student newspaper's circular purpose. Likewise, because compliance with the nurse's associate code of ethics is a legitimate part of the associate degree of nursing program curriculum, speech reflecting noncompliance with the code that is related to academic activities materially disrupts the legitimate educational concerns. In addition to urging an overbroad categorical standard, Keefe's contention is factually flawed in asserting that his offensive Facebook posts were unrelated to any course assignments or requirements. The summary judgment record conclusively establishes that the posts were directed at classmates involving their conduct in the nursing program and include a physical threat related to medical studies. I'm going to give someone a whatever, which I don't think quite qualifies as a physical threat. I don't, I don't think it was intended as a threat, nor can it be reasonably perceived as a threat. It's more intended as a, I am frustrated. I, he uses a complicated medical term for this thing which seems more like flaunting. It doesn't seem like it's a threat, but no. Two of the victims, strange terminology to me. I don't think they're victims, and it does kind of gild the lily, as Legal Eagle would say. It gilds the lily by kind of presuming the consequence you want to read. Two victims of Keefe's tirades complained to instructor Kim Scott, one saying that she could not function in the same clinical space as Keefe, grow a pair, I would say, Keefe's disrespectful and threatening statements towards his colleagues have a direct impact on the educational experience. I'm not sure how, but okay. Keefe's threats, you keep using that word, I'm not quite sure that that's what it is, but all right, could have prompted a disciplinary proceeding. Instead, the administrators conclude the post, combined with the failure to appreciate the seriousness of the problem. I don't appreciate the seriousness of the problem. Apparently, Apparently, me and Keith are roughly the same because I don't appreciate the seriousness of the problem. It doesn't seem particularly serious to me. It seems as a person blowing off steam and just expressing overall negative views and being frustrated. It doesn't seem serious, no. This reflected a lack of professionalism that warranted his removal from the nursing program. That decision, of course, can be questioned, but the First Amendment did not bar educator Frisch from making the determination that Keefe was unable to meet the professional demands of being a nurse. Not sure why, but okay. Keefe argues the defendants violated the First Amendment rights by failing to cite specific standards that he violated. 
which would have been helpful. The district court expressly rejected this contention. Part of the program was devoted to instilling students the standard of the profession. The associate degree nursing program incorporated nationally established nursing standards. Its ability to discipline students for behavior unbecoming of a nursing profession. Really? This is behavior unbecoming? They have very, very, they're, they're, they're a little bit intolerant of stuff in the nursing program, it seems. Or transgression of professional boundaries. Which this seems like it's a transgression of professional boundaries to me to do this because this isn't really quite professional. This is just a person expressing opinions. Am I not allowed to have, I'm a professional too. Am I not allowed to have prof opinions? I thought I was. Oh well. This reflects the ability of the Minnesota Board of Nursing to devire, deny, revoke, suspend, limit, or condition a license and registration of any persons to practice professional, advanced, registered, or practical nursing or engaging in unprofessional conduct. Grant specificity is not required. Seems odd. If you're going to adopt rules, then they should be pursuant to those rules. Just a general, we don't want to, seems a little insufficient to my mind. This, this court seems, I can't quite get behind the, 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 the reasoning of this court. It seems not in keeping with what was actually said. It seems not in keeping with the concerns. It feels reaching. So I, I can't quite agree with the Court of Appeals. And I, there is a dissent in this opinion, at least in part. So, I, yeah, I can't quite agree with this. This doesn't seem to trigger the concerns that the court is illuminating. Yeah, we agree. Okay, students in the nursing program consent and right to be bound by the National Code of Ethics. And the program handbook states a violation of moral, ethical, or professional standards may require in the dismissal of the program. I'm not quite sure which of these things the Facebook posts were. Were the Facebooks immoral, unethical, or unprofessional? And if so, why? I don't know. Are nurses not allowed to say, my colleagues are frustrating me and I'm, I'm upset about it? It seems odd. These standards are necessarily quite general, but they're widely recognized and followed. Okay, I'm not quite sure. I'm, I'm not a nurse. I'm a lawyer. So I'm not familiar with the nursing standards, but the way you're describing them to me doesn't quite seem to me that you violated any of those standards, as far as I can tell. It wasn't done in the classroom. It wasn't done to a patient. It was done on Facebook on their own time and didn't it didn't mention anyone specifically by name that we saw. It just said, I'm frustrated. My fellow student changed something. I'd give them an F if I could. And if someone is frustrating me, I'm going to do this, which seems hyperbolic. It doesn't seem like it's an actual threat to my mind. So I'm not a nurse, nor am I familiar with these professional standards of nursing. However, I am fairly familiar with the professional standards for a lawyer. And I don't quite see how this would map onto that. It, it, yeah, it doesn't seem right. In two decisions, the United States Supreme Court has assumed without deciding that federal courts can review an academic decision of a public educational institution under substitute process, which makes sense because public institution means the Constitution applies. So, yes, assumingly, yes, a court could review that for violation of constitutional rights. That's a thing the court could do, presumably, yes. In this case, we doubt there's a cause of action. Really? Though Keefe was removed from the nursing program, he was allowed to remain at the school and transfer his credits to another program. I don't quite see how that follows from the Court of Appeals. They say we doubt that there's a cause of action because he's allowed to keep his credits and transfer to a different program. But he wasn't allowed to keep them for the purpose he earned them. He was deprived of a value of those classes. Part of the value of the classes was to qualify for them. If he had taken them as electives in the first place, then sure. But that isn't what he did, nor his understanding of them. They were took for a specific purpose, which is no longer available. So it seems to me that he has an interest in those classes. Even if a substantive due process claim is cognizable in these circumstances, there is no violation of substantive due process under misconduct a government official that violates a right that's so egregious, so outrageous, it may be fairly said to shock the, the conscience of justices, which apparently this doesn't for something. In our view, it is clear that the defendant's decision to remove Keefe from the nursing program rested on an academic judgment that's not beyond the pale of reasoned academic decision making. That seems like a high standard, but okay. The defendant's action in quietly, ooh, quietly removing Keefe from the nursing program for behavior he admitted to was unethical and unprofessional, while allowing him to remain cool. School is far from shock, conscious shocking. 
Keith further argues the defendant violated his right to procedural due process, a more difficult issue. The Supreme Court has held that a short disciplinary suspension requires a student be given an oral or written notice, and if he denies them an explanation of explanation of evidence, the authorities have an opportunity to present his side of the story. In this case, Keefe argues he is removed from the nursing program for disciplinary reasons. Defendant responds and the district court agreed that removal is properly characterized as academic and therefore the less stringent procedural requirements require, namely that due process was satisfied because he was informed of the dissatisfaction and the ultimate decision was careful and deliberate. Not sure about that on procedure, but okay, Court of Appeals. Due process is flexible and calls for such procedural protections as the situation demands. When conduct that leads to an adverse academic decision is of a disciplinary nature, due process may require the protections of Goss and Lopez in determining whether the student was guilty of misconduct. Goss involved 10-day suspension of high school students. The court was focused on, on determining what pre-suspension due process was due. But where public schools provide additional post-removal procedures, as here, the due process requirements for the hearing can vary depending on the nature of the proceedings. When post-removal proceedings are available, a timely pre-removal meeting that affords a student an opportunity to be heard serves as a check against mistaken decisions the prior case law requires. Even if this was a purely disciplinary decision, as Keefe contends, he was entitled to oral or written notice of the charges and an explanation of the evidence and an opportunity to present his side of the story. Keefe complains that Frisch did not inform him of the contents of the meeting before the meeting and did not let him read, let him read the posts at the meeting. But the constitutional requirement of due process does not turn on formalities. I think it does turn on formalities, yes. Uh, due, due process often turns on formalities. There, there, there is pro you are entitled to process. The formality of the process, whatever it might be, might be a thing. So the court saying here it doesn't turn on formalities. I'm like, mm, it might turn on formalities a little bit when those things are not, e not being provided. Yeah. The very fact he couldn't read what the allegations against him that's odd it's like can i read the allegations no but i'll read them to you it's like I, can i read them myself no okay that seems odd due process does not require a delay between the notice and an opportunity to respond here as in the prior case law fish met with keith informed him there were concerns regarding facebook read the posts of greatest concern which don't seem that concerning to my ear Explain his post, implicate the professionalism and boundaries of the nursing program. Really? How? And give him an opportunity to respond. What is important is that Keefe admitted for summary judgment purposes that he authored the post, meaning there's no material factual disputes. Okay. As given an opportunity to respond, which provides the predicate for the academic decision to dismiss him from the program. Nursing, nursing schools are pansies. They're all pansies, man. They can't take anything. Jeez, they're pansies. These posts don't seem that aggressive to me. They seem like a person just blowing off a little steam and they don't seem to be particularly concerning. Nursing students are wusses, I guess, geez. Moreover, the notion that Keefe had inadequate notice of what the meeting would concern does not withstand scrutiny. After Keefe sent Fish an email asking for more detail, Fish responded that the topic of professional boundary is central to the role of nurse. I'm sure you appreciate the delicacy of the topic. You could inform me more specifically about exactly what's talking going on. So, yes, in general, professionalism is important. What do you want to talk about in relation to that? You don't want to tell me in advance. That seems problematic to me. Keith made his classmates know they'd be held to pay for every complaint to me, which, again, seems a little bit, it seems a little bit obtuse for a threat. It seems like, yeah, there'd be held to pay. I, it doesn't quite strike me as a, as a threat. It's, again, a person blowing off steam. It's a little vague. It seems just not quite in, in keeping. You know, and he's not a teacher or someone where there'd be concerns. He's just a student. So his, his how would he make hell for him? I don't know. By not being friends with him anymore or something. It, it just it doesn't strike me as clear enough for a direct threat. When Frisch called Keefe and moved the meeting up one day so we not be treated as next clinical class with the student concerned about the threat, Keefe again asked what the meeting was about. Frisch asked that she would prefer to discuss it in the process, but the due process would follow. This was an adequate informal notice. Leaves a little bit to be decided. Viewing the summary judgment record as a whole, we conclude that Keefe was provided sufficient notice of the dissatisfaction by not being provided a copy of what was being presented, nor being given an opportunity to respond beyond the scope of the meeting, 
not being told in advance. That's adequate. We're not going to tell you and we're only going to tell you orally. And then we want you to respond to these things, which don't seem that problematic or concerning to me. Seems a little bit. Okay. An explanation of why his behavior felt short of professionalism. I'd like an explanation of why it felt short of professionalism. Can someone explain it to me? Because I don't understand it. An opportunity to respond to the initial decision maker. An opportunity to appeal the hearing to someone else who's, yeah. Nothing in the record suggests the removal from the nursing program was not careful and deliberate, genuine academic decision. Numerous prior decisions confirm due process does not require more. The judgment of the district court is affirmed. Because we reject the constitutional claim on the merits, we need not address the defendant's alternative claims that they're entitled to qualified immunity. So that is the end of the case by request of Keefe versus Adams. In this case, we learned that Mr. Keefe was dismissed from school because of some Facebook posts, which at least to my mind do not seem particularly concerning nor particularly unprofessional. But the university didn't see it that way, and two of his fellow female classmates didn't see it that way. And these, these classmates, despite going into nursing, apparently are pansies. So despite having you know to deal with blood and guts and all the rest of it, they apparently can't take these posts, which seem pretty banal to my eye. But apparently I don't know what I'm talking about because the university decided to not let him be a nurse because of these posts. And the Court of Appeals in analyzing this says it's totally okay. I, I have some serious reservations with this decision. I have some serious reservations with the analysis of the facts. I have some serious reservations that these decisions were reasonable and should be upheld. I have serious reservations with the idea that he was given enough process for it and or the decision was within the scope of reasonableness. So while I think in general, courts probably shouldn't second guess academic decisions, I think that this one doesn't meet that standard. So if I were on the Court of Appeals, I would be inclined to go the other way in this fact pattern. And there was at least one partial dissent, so at least someone partially agrees with me. But that's the decision of the Court of Appeals, so that's the end of the coverage of this case.